Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the February 18th, 2021 meeting of the SACOG Board of Directors. And we will um, go ahead with um, a Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm going to go ahead and lead us in the pledge. And I'm sure somebody is going to go ahead and put up a flag. So if you would all please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance. Wow. The Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And now we will go ahead and um, take our roll call. Thank you. Before we get started, as Chair Gore said, this meeting is being recorded and being live streamed on our website. Excuse me. For members of uh, the board participating by the by telephone, please press star nine if you'd like to make a comment. And um, other board members, please raise your hand. Use the raise hand feature in Zoom so that we can track uh, who would like to make a comment. <coughs> also, just a reminder that if you're not speaking, if you could please mute your device so we don't have feedback noise, we would appreciate that. Uh, now for roll call, Director Baines. Present. Ernest Coney? Here. Bradford? Here. Branscombe? Here. Bulahan? Here. Burris? Here. Bart Kretz? I saw her on the attendance list, so I'll note her uh, present for the record. Desmond? Here. Frericks? Here. Frost? Here. Gialdo? Here. Dog? Yes. Guerrero? Here. Harris? Here. Joyner? Here. Kennedy? Here. Kozlowski? Here. Lozano? Here. Middleton? Here. New? Here. Sander? Here. Saragossa? Here. Sailor? Here. Janier? Absent Spokely? Here. Dallard? Here. Soon? Here. Thomas? Here. West? Absent Vice Chair Jennings? Here. Chair Gore? Here. And ex officio member Benny Paul? Here. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, appreciate that. And before we get started, I first of all wanted to welcome Director Pamela Bulahan and oh, she's from Ielton. Uh, she started with the board. Um, Director Bulahan replaces Iva Walton, who had to resign her appointment due to her scheduling conflicts. So we're glad to have you, um, Director Bulahan. And also you'll notice um, a new feature on the staff reports. And uh, we're now going to have the um, referring committee. Um, so the committee that heard the item, whether it's the transportation committee or the um, policy and innovation committee, if those items have been heard in that committee, you will see in the staff report, the referring committee. Um, and that just allows us all to know that a group of us have already heard this item um, and have had an opportunity to, to hear about the item and have some discussion. So thank you to Vice Chair Jennings for that suggestion. And finally, before we get started today, I wanted to announce that we will um, once again convene a working group on race, equity, and inclusion this year. Uh, some of you served on the group this last year, and we're going to go ahead and put together a working group um, to continue to guide the, the agency's racial equity work. Uh, this next year. Um, and we'll probably not eat, meet every month, but probably every two to three months this year. So meaning about four to six times this year. And we're, look, lurking, we're looking to also have a couple of um, community members, um, stakeholders join some of our board members. So if you are interested in participating um, in this group, um, it'll, it'll sort of mirror a little bit of what we did with the commercial corridor task force this past year. If you're interested in participating, 
please Lynn, let Lynette know um, that you're interested. We'll uh, move forward with that working group. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to public communications. And this is a time for anyone who wishes to address this board on an item that is not on our agenda. Um, Lynette, do you have anyone who would like to make a comment, make a public comment? I do, Chair Gore. We do have a comment from a Rancho Murrieta a citizen. I'll go ahead and read that letter now. Good morning, my name is John Merchant. I wish to speak to the realignment of Scott Road and its importance to our community. The JPA connector will replace the Scott Road and White Rock Road intersection with a temporary right turn only configuration. A permanent intersection requires funding and an application for that funding is under consideration in your 2021 maintenance and modernization category. Our 5,700 residents believe we must advocate personally for this project. Rancho Marietta itself is not a city, a county, or a regional transit district. We are not Caltrans, who alone asks for 107 million or 25% of the 2021 funding allowance. This JPA sponsored intersection is 0.008% of what has been requested by the entire region. For us, this is not a convenience or an upgrade project. This is our major artery and a key access to medical services. SACOG is aware of how critical this project is to our community. We have voiced our concerns of the danger in changing lanes to make U-turns on the high-speed connector. We have reminded you that many of our drivers are senior citizens. We have submitted a petition with 1,425 signatures expressing our safety concerns. You also have 15 letters of support from our representatives, district government, HOAs, and commercial entities. Our residents continue to send you email on a daily basis. We are accustomed to the poor condition of our rural roads and their low priority. However, this intersection is a game changer for our community and it directly impacts our access to necessary services. We also have significant safety concerns. Without your help, this temporary intersection may be with us for years to come. Please take these comments into consideration as you make your funding decision. That concludes our public communications. Thank you, Lynette. And before we move on, anybody else from the public who wants to make a comment? All right, doesn't look like there are. So thank you for we'll adjourn as SACOG and convene as the airport, airport land use commission. And the airport land, but airport land use commission agenda um, is a, a separate item, just lost my notes. Uh, so it's, it's separate um, agenda item than the one that our board has. And the item on the agenda, the action item is the Mather Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan Update, Public Release of Environmental Document and Displacement Analysis. So um, Greg Chu, if you would present the item, please. Okay, thank you, Chair uh, Gore. Uh, my name is Greg Chu. I'm on the planning staff at SACOG. I also serve as the Airport Land Use Compatibility um, or Airport Land Use Commission staff person. Um, staff, can you put up the PowerPoint? Uh, while that's being loaded up, um, uh, this issue uh, on the Mather Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan has been off and on before the um, this board uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, and because it doesn't come up often, I'm gonna, and we have a number of new uh, board members, I'm going to uh, give the background about what your role is as the Airport Land Use Commission. Go ahead and change the slide, please. Uh, and and uh, give you that background first before we get into this, uh, what the substance of this particular action item is. So uh, uh, the purpose of uh, your role as the Airport Land Use Commission is to ensure that future compatibility of land use near airports. Uh, in the early 70s, for those that were here in this region, there was a bad airport uh, airplane crash in Executive Airport uh, in the early 70s. A uh, pilot was about to take off uh, from Executive Airport, had a heart attack just as he was leaving, uh, and crashed into an ice cream parlor full of kids on a hot um, summer day, uh, killed about 35 people. As a result, the state uh, said uh, that uh, instituted uh, some compatibility requirements, um, and uh, by doing so, 
uh, came out with some standards and designated um, various entities across the state, uh, including councils of governments to serve as the, what we call the airport land use commission. So uh, you as the SACOG board would be serving as uh, the airport land use commission. Uh, your primary role uh, is to coordinate airport compatibility planning, particularly in the form of adopting what we call uh, airport land use compatibility plans. I'll get to that in a second. But the main point of the plan is to make sure that local land uses uh, near airports, future land uses are compatible so that we don't have schools and hospitals at the end of runways or, or high cell towers uh, near, near runways. So uh, for uh, SACOG's purposes as the Airport Land Use Commission, uh, we serve it for four counties, uh, Sacramento, Sutter, Yuba, and Yolo counties. Uh, El Dorado and Placer counties each have their own Airport Land Use Commissions, but the full board of SACOG serves as Airport Land Use Commission for these four counties. Next slide, please. Uh, what, uh, so the compatibility plan is really the most important thing that uh, in your role uh, as the AOUC is adopting these plans. So for each of the, we have 16 airports in the four counties that are public use or publicly owned. Uh, and we have to adopt these plans. We have them uh, and periodically they need updating about every 20 years or so. So what these plans are is to ensure that future land uses are compatible with the airports. And we look at uh, four criteria, I'll get to these in a second, but there's noise and safety are the really the, the most important. Uh, we don't want, um, safety is about making sure uh, if there's gonna be a crash, statistically, we have good information about where a crash is likely to occur and we don't want to have uh, densely populated areas. And noise is uh, we don't want uh, people too close to uh, the airport uh, where they're gonna be bothered by noise. Um, we'll talk about the other two factors. But one of the critical fact uh, things about the Airport Land Use uh, Commission is this is not about the operation of the airport or the facilities of the airport or anything aviation related. That's uh, not the role of the Airport Land Use Commission. It is simply to make sure that lands uh, outside of the airport are compatible uses um, with the airport. Next slide, please. Uh, as your staff person, um, we bring policies and the draft plans to the board for review. Um, and then uh, once they're adopted, uh, then uh, we work with the local agencies. Uh, we review individual development applications near the airports uh, to make sure they're consistent with the plans. Um, if need be, we make recommendations to the board uh, as needed and we coordinate uh, with the Caltrans staff. Uh, everything that we do, we're accountable to Caltrans. They provide guidance about how this works and uh, keep us up to date on state requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, so for local jurisdictions, um, many of your jurisdictions have airports in or near uh, nearby. Um, so we just need to make sure that all land use plans are consistent with, with the airport land use compatibility plan. Uh, 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 local agencies work with AOUC staff. Uh, they submit, uh, the main thing that they do is they submit applications uh, to us to review for consistency. However, one thing all, all local jurisdictions have is the ability to override. If there's a reason why a jurisdiction really feels like, even though it's, it may not be consistent with the airport land use compatibility plan, a city council or a board of supervisors may override that with a two thirds uh, override vote um, and then some documentation. And uh, there have been examples of that in the past where there's reasons um, why that local jurisdiction felt it was necessary. Next slide, please. So why, why is this coming up uh, specifically for Mather? Uh, why are we updating this? Uh, well, first of all, it's more than 20 years since the plan was last adopted. Um, and uh, more importantly um, is uh, Sacramento County Department of Airports, which runs uh, uh, the airport there. Uh, they've updated their master plan a few years ago. The master plan is, does address operations and facilities and things like that. So because that has been updated and there's been changes in the amount of um, traffic there and the type of aircraft and the impacts that it has, uh, 
for consistency, we want to update the AOUCP. Uh, new developments also being planned around the airport. We just want to make sure that that is consistent. Uh, and then uh, we are working in tandem with the Sacramento County Department of Airports. Next slide, please. Uh, so what's in the AOUCP? Uh, so I mentioned these compatibility factors. I'll show you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's just a, a visual interpretation of this. So uh, the lower uh, levels are the most important. Uh, Safety is by far the most important. We don't want um, uh, accidents to happen. Uh, and if they do, we don't want them, we don't want people to be at risk. So uh, depending on where uh, uh, land is relative to the, to the airport runway and where there's likely to be a crash, we try to limit the amount of people that would be affected by that. The second level is noise. We have noise contours uh, for uh, uh, different levels um, and different levels of intensity. Um, so we consider that. Airspace protection is height issues. Uh, we don't want cell towers or certain things that are of a certain height to be too close to the airport. And then uh, overflight, with the, which is a subjective um, noise interpretation, even though they may not be in the noise contours, uh, we do want to make sure that people have a uh, notification that there, there are airport noise impacts. Next slide, please. So here's an example of the noise contours um, around for this particular airport at Mather. Uh, the closer you are in, um, the less, less likely to development would be allowed. Um, and at a certain point, uh, residential would not be allowed. Uh, next slide, please. So with that corresponding map, uh, we, in the plan, we have different compatibility standards. So depending on where, where different land use is, that's what the column is going down. It, we, have, we identify all land uses that a jurisdiction may have, and then whether or not they're compatible, red, green, or yellow, uh, depending on where they are in relation to the noise. Next slide, please. Uh, the same thing with safety. Uh, again, the closer to the end of the runway, the more likely it's going to be uh, something um, where we want to tr try to Im uh, reduce impacts. Um, so we have these different standards. Again, these are all uh, defined by the state uh, and, and our consultant team has uh, applied this to this airport. Next slide, please. And again, we have a compatibility plan table that goes with that depending on which safety zone you're in. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the plan was developed uh, with a technical advisory committee uh, comprised of the jurisdictions uh, that are either directly affected or have some interest in the airport, City of Rancho Cordova, Folsom, uh, County of Sacramento, El Dorado County, um, school districts, and uh, Caltrans. So they met four times during the development process. Next slide, please. So where we're at today is uh, this issue has been before the board um, in the past off and on. Um, and in September, uh, we presented the draft uh, AOUCP uh, for public review and the board allowed us to do that. We had a 30 day period uh, to receive comments. We received those comments and we made changes to uh, the plan uh, based on them. And then uh, we conducted to start the environmental process, we did an initial study uh, and that included what's called a development displacement analysis. So what impacts would adopting this plan have on future development? Would land uses uh, that, um, uh, would they be impacted by that? Uh, and would um, uh, impacts uh, be displaced to other areas such as traffic or noise or air pollution? Uh, those, those things were considered. So what you are being asked to do uh, today or requested today is uh, to allow staff to release these documents, including the updated airport land use compatibility plan to the public so that we can get comments for the next 30 days on, on the analysis, the environmental document and any comments on the plan. And then we can analyze them and then in April or May, we would come back to you uh, with the comments and possible adjustments and then bring forward uh, the final action to adopt the plan in uh, later this spring. 
So uh, last slide, please. So here's where we're at. Uh, basically everything on the first, the top half of this is actions that we've taken to date to get to this point, uh, which was to release the, the draft plan. Um, and now we're in February uh, with uh, release of the secret document and the analysis, the technical analysis that goes with that. And then in April uh, or May would be the adoption of the plan itself. Uh, and uh, go ahead and go to the last slide. So um, I'll be glad to answer questions. With me today is uh, Chris Jones. He's our consultant with uh, ESA Associates. And uh, Glenn Rickleton um, is with the County Department of Planning. Go ahead. Go ahead. Great, thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate that report. Um, any questions um, from the our directors? Everybody raise your hand on the on the chat function. Um, and then, are there any members from the public who would like to ask a question in regards to this item or make a public comment? I don't see any public comment. All right, so I'll bring it back to uh, the board uh, for action. Joiner moves approval of the item. I second the motion. And that second was uh, Director Baines? That's correct. All right, so let's go ahead and do a roll call, please. Thank you, Director Baines? Or am I allowed to do a pass fail motion? I'm sorry, Chair Gore, what was that? Um, do we have to do a roll call? Or I do. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. My notes. Okay. Thank you. Director Baines? Aye. Bernasconi? Aye. Bradford? Aye. Branscombe? Aye. Bulahan? Aye. Burris? Aye. Clark Kretz? Aye. Desmond? Aye. Ferrix? Aye. Frost? Aye. Gialdo? Aye. Gog? Yes. Guerrero? I'll come back to you. Harris? Yes. Joyner? Aye. Kennedy? Kozlowski? Yes. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Come back to you, New. Aye. Sander. Aye. Zaragoza. Aye. Taylor. Oh yeah. Aye. Janier absent. Spokely. Yes. Allard. Stallard. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> Soon. Aye. Thomas. Aye. West. Absent, Vice Chair Binnings? Aye. Chair Gore? Aye. Coming back to Director Guerrero? I'll mark her absent and Middleton? I'll mark her absent as well, motion carries. Great, thank you very much. Um, I see Director Stollard has raised his hand. So uh, Director Stollard, did you have a comment, a question? I do, um, I voted to support this action. Uh, I felt that uh, Greg Chu's <clears throat> presentation was correct, but I would like to suggest that there's something more that we need to do as a regional council, and that is to protect our airports. Uh, uh, airports are challenged by development and uh, there are very significant forces at work uh, to skinny down the areas around airports. Uh, I was here in 1997 when we went through this the last time and there was a lot of pressure uh, as we have more people moving into the areas adjacent to airports, there'll be more sound complaints coming to all of us as electeds. And I, I realized the pressures on those in the immediate airspace areas, but, but uh, that airport given to us by the federal government is worth scores of millions of dollars. And it was originally intended as a, a, as a delivery uh, airport for the, the carriers that deliver uh, stuff in the planes. Well, anyway, what I'm just saying is if we're not careful, we could lose it because it becomes no longer functional. 
So I just feel like we as a regional council need to keep that in mind and be careful that we don't push the noise contour tours so close to the airport that they can't operate the aircraft that is needed to bring the, the shipments in and out. That's my message, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate those comments. Um, they are uh, well taken and important to remind us of the value of our airports. Let's go ahead and adjourn as the ALUC and reconvene as SAFECOG. And we will move to the consent agenda, the consent calendar. These items are intended to be approved in one motion. However, anyone can remove an item for separate discussion. So does a director wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? <coughs> and I'll move the item. Thank you. seconds. Okay. So uh, we've got a motion and did we hear who moved and who seconded it? Cause I did not see your faces. Uh, no. Saragossa moved. All right, uh, roll call please, Lynette. Thank you. Director Bain? Aye. Bernasconi? Aye. Bradford? Aye. Branscombe? Aye. Bulahan? Aye. Burris? Aye. Clark Kretz? Aye. Desmond? Aye. Frerix? Aye. Frost? Aye. Thank you. Gallardo? Aye. Bob? Yes. Guerrero? Absent Harris? Yes. Joyner? Yes. Kennedy? Aye. Kozlowski? Yes. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Absent New? Aye. Sander? Aye. Saragossa? Aye. Sailor? Aye. Janir Spokley? Yes. Ballard? Yes. Soon? Aye. Thomas? Aye. West? Absent Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Chair Gore? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, the consent calendar is approved and we will move on to action item number eight and that is to approve the 2020-2024 Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program Amendment 1 to the 2020 Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy and Air Quality Conformity Analysis. That was a mouthful. Um, so Dustin Foster, if you would go ahead and please present the item. Thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate your, your introduction, so I won't have to repeat all of that. Uh, <laughs> good morning, directors. My name is Dustin Foster. I am on the programming and project delivery team here at SACOG. Uh, as our chair just uh, stated, the action before the board this morning is to adopt the draft 21 to 2024 20, uh, MTIP. Um, the Transportation Committee uh, recommended board approval at the February meeting. Uh, my plan is to be brief, uh, maybe take a couple minutes to preserve time for questions and the upcoming uh, workshop. Um, since we have new board members and received good questions at the committee, we wanted to go over a few of them briefly this morning. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague, Renee Devere Oki. She led the development of the air quality conformity analysis, which is attachment D2. Uh, she's here for any answer. Uh, she can answer any questions related to the development of that document. Um, so the primary focus this morning is to describe the MTIP's relation to the MTP. The two documents differ uh, most notably in that the MTP SES is a long-term plan. So it contains goals, strategies, and principles, and identifies real and illustrative projects going out to 2040. The MTIP uh, is a short-term program or a list of projects with more detailed scopes, schedules, and funding whose funding years cover 2021 to 2024. Um, so this does not change any of the MTP SES policies. This is instead of a program of pro pro uh, projects that have been awarded funds, and they are meant to help implement the plan. Um, one could describe the MTIP as like the next four years of the MTP SES. Um, so the, the real connection relation is that the MTIP project list is contained within the larger MTP SES project list. Um, both the MTIP and the MTP SES list projects for a region, and both have been analyzed for financial constraint and air quality conformity. 
Um, another big question is, does it change the MTP? As I just uh, stated, it doesn't change the policies of the MTP, but it does make changes to the projects in the MTP SCS project list, um, especially those in the next four years. Um, so the MTP SCS update um, is the preferred process for adding new regionally significant projects to the MTP SCS. Um, but you know, projects could be added or, or updated via an MTIP update such as this. Uh, or a joint MTIP and MTP SCS amendment. So with that, really just um, your approval today will keep us all on track for cities, counties, transit agencies to obligate $370 million of federal funds over the next four fiscal years. Um, and we'll continue to move projects uh, to be delivered this fiscal year uh, and, and the, those coming up. Um, plus, you know, also just to give some assurance, this is a static view a uh, point in time view of those project lists. Projects change very often. Uh, staff here have an administrative authority to make certain changes to projects, which occur, uh, we, we do those roughly every month. They're called admin mods, uh, administrative modifications, excuse me. Um, and we work with your agency staff directly and we'd be happy to brief them on any necessary changes. Uh, finally, my favorite Beatles song, I get by with a little help from my friends. I wanted to be on here and uh, just thank all of your staff for all their help. We couldn't have uh, done it without them. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll pause for any questions. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you for uh, defining one of the, um, what are those things called? Anyway, blanking. All right, so let's go ahead and um, move to any questions from uh, directors. Are there any questions from directors on this item? And not seeing any, then we'll see if there's anybody from the public who wishes to comment on this item. There's no public comment. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for a motion. June moves. Getting second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Thank you. Director Baines? Aye. Bernasconi? Aye. Bradford? Aye. Branscom? Aye. Bulahan? Aye. Burris? Aye. Clark Kretz? Aye. Desmond? Aye. Ferrix? Aye. Frost? Aye. Gialdo? Aye. Gog? Yes. Guerrero? Aye. Harris? Aye. Joyner? Yes. Kennedy? Aye. Kozlowski? Yes. Thank you. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Absent? New? Aye. Sander? Aye. Zaragoza? Aye. Sailor? Aye. Chenier Absent Spokely? Yes. Ballard? Yes. Soon? Aye. Thomas? Aye. West absent, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Chair Gore? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, um, we're going to move to our workshop. This is item number nine on the agenda and it's our housing policy and racial inequality uh, workshop. Uh, James Corliss is going to go ahead and kick this off and just sort of a, a refresh. We did a lot of these in person uh, in 2019, um, but have not had an opportunity to do, to do workshops recently. Um, but we're going to try to do those um, as we uh, get ourselves sort of um, continue to get ourselves educated about um, issues that are of importance to the to this board. So James, if you want to go ahead and kick off the item and introduce our speaker as uh, Stephen Menendian. Thank you, Chair Gore. Happy to do this. Um, so, as you just said, and I and I, I, I do want to pause here and just make sure you know we are doing the best uh, right now <clears throat> in the very early stages of this year with a lot of new board members to really try to explain, <clears throat> in some ways, be your tour guides for why you're hearing certain items. Uh, the last item you heard some explanation from our staff and Dustin Foster about trying to clearly tell you you know what the MTIP is and how it's different than the long range plan. And as you said, Chair Gore, these workshops, we actually have not, I don't believe we've done one 
for quite some time in a virtual environment. Maybe there was one. Um, <clears throat> So just to reorient everybody, um, actually Chair Chenier, um, about three years ago, really wanted to get a sort of a deep dive on topics that were issues that were going to come before the board uh, in the near future. Weren't necessarily something you were gonna be voting on that same board meeting, but, but really allowing you all a chance to roll up your sleeves, to listen, to ask questions, and for us to bring in some outside speakers and experts. And so that's exactly what we're doing today. And I'm. I'm really excited that we have this workshop lined up for you. Now, all three committees really <coughs> received a staff uh, presentation from Dob Caden <clears throat> introducing this topic and how government policy, in particular government policy, was used in the past as a tool for racial exclusion, historically by race, later by income. That historical context and those presentations by Dob was intended really as background for today's workshop. So um, you may ask yourself, uh, why are we hearing this and why are we hearing it now? So three things. The first is, uh, and Chair Gore, you, you mentioned the Race Equity Inclusion Working Group um, that, that's gonna get reconvened this year. This really is a follow-on in some ways to our racial equity framework, the work that the staff and the REI Working Group did, did last year to explicitly delve into really important regional topics with a racial equity lens. And I can't think of a better, more timely one right now than housing. Second, uh, we have as SACOG and all of you as local governments, an actual legal responsibility to affirmatively further fair housing. I know that's a mouthful, but it is in state statute. So <clears throat> we have to do everything we can to reduce barriers and encourage more housing and multifamily housing and housing that's accessible to all um, especially in high opportunity areas. And Dov Caden touched on that. So we have a, we have a state uh, 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 mandate and requirement to actually look at not just housing in general, but affirmatively further, furthering fair housing. We did that through our arena. And now uh, third, third point about why you're hearing this now, because we're on the tail end of the RENA cycle, the regional housing needs allocation, trying not to use too many acronyms. And all of your jurisdictions this year will be adopting and updating your housing elements. So it really is incredibly timely. And I know Chair Gore, you've, uh, you've put a big emphasis on, on housing this year um, and we really appreciated that. So I'm excited to be introducing our speaker for the workshop, uh, Dr. Stephen Menendian. Stephen's the policy director at the UC Berkeley Othering and Belonging Institute. Stephen's primary areas of expertise are structural racism, fair housing and civil rights law. And Stephen's presentation today is gonna to be focused on the intersection of current housing policy and racial inequality, including some of his recent research on contemporary racial segregation in the Bay Area. And I know we always try to have examples from either around uh, the state of California or other metro regions that are like ours. Stephen's research is in the nine county Bay Area. Uh, he's gone deep in the Bay Area. And so just so you all understand, I think there's a lot that he is going to share with his research that's focused and a lot that we can learn, I think, in this region, too. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Stephen Menendian. Thank you so much, James. I appreciate the introduction, and it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, a couple of preliminary notes. First, forgive me for wearing a, a visor and informality. I'm covering up for the fact that I haven't been to a barber in a year and uh, that I've been... Um, cutting my own hair. Um, also, uh, when Dove approached me about uh, presenting in front of you, he asked if I could talk about the relationship between land use and zoning, between zoning and race, zoning and class, uh, land use policy and affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFFH, and uh, RENA, uh, the relationship between past discrimination and present day effects, and more. And I said, okay, we have three hours or three days. So no, you have 30 minutes. Okay, well, let's see what we can do. Um, so James and Dove and I got on a call and we kind of narrowed down the focus of this and to try and focus on present day effects. But then last night, I, I listened to the recording that Dove sent me of one of your previous meetings um, and uh, realized that <laughs> there was even more that I needed to try and address. So um, let, me, let me open up the, the slide deck um, 
yeah, the uh, the conversation that you had, I think last time was really important, but also I think kind of pushed me in, in some slightly different directions. So let's see if I can, I'm trying to buy time as I open up this, uh, this slide deck I put together for you. Um, it would be great if someone can tell me if you can see this. Yes, we can see it. Great. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. So, if you want to go into the presentation mode of it, would be, it would make it larger. Okay. Is it is it not full screen right now? Not really. It's that you not know really. it's, all your slides in the left as well. To, yeah. Yeah, I'm in. I'm actually in. Pinch out to go. enlarge it. It's showing my desktop. Well, it's showing the full the window full of PowerPoint. Window. Okay. Well, I'm pre on my screen. I'm pressing slideshow presentation mode and scrolling through. What about now? Even if you like, I can share it from my end, and you can just tell me next slide. Okay. Um. Let me try and stop sharing and do it one more time and see if this works. Sorry, we all, always going to be a risk of technical issues. Okay, application window. What about now? What Today's I'm looking at is a slide that says zoning and land use. This is Lynette, the clerk to the board. We do have our technical support has your slide deck and if it's okay, we'll go ahead and have them display it. And then sure. you can just look at the screen and just let them know when you'd like to advance each slide. Okay. Renee, could Let's you go that. ahead and pull that up? Yes, I'm gonna pull it up right now. Thank you. And don't worry about it. I, it happens to all of it. <laughs> uh, the scariest one was last year I was giving a presentation for a Florida Realtors Conference and we had pre prepared the tech system several times and then just as I started speaking the entire thing crashed including audio so this isn't it was for a thousand people so this is <laughs> not quite as is uh, daunting as that okay thank you I see that it's up we'll proceed to the first full slide so just very quickly, I just want to get on the same page on what we're talking about. We're talking about zoning and land use. Um, I'm not going to define zoning for you. Uh, you all know what zoning is and how it's, but the one thing I just want to emphasize is that zoning is only one form of land use regulation. There are over 30,000 municipalities, townships, and other municipal or local government entities in the United States that have land use authority. But what I do want to do is suggest a set of heuristics for thinking about zoning. You know, zoning is a, when I speak with reporters, what I realize is that there are certain terms that uh, have acquired kind of cultural currency that are used not in a particular or specific way, but that are used in a general, as almost a synecdoche to stand in for a certain set of things. So for example, redlining. Redlining is a very particular practice, but it has now become a sort of a stand-in for all exclusionary and racialized land use policies. Um, and so what I want to do when I talk about zoning is I want to talk about three different types of zoning. If you could click. So the first type of zoning, just quickly, is what's known as racial zoning. And this was the first form of zoning that emerged in the first decade of the 20th century. And this zoning was first enacted. Uh, well, there were different forms of it. One form actually emerged in the, in the Bay Area that sort of restricted where, for example, Chinese laundries could be uh, could operate. But the first residential form of this emerged in Baltimore, I think around 1910. And what it did was it specifically said that people of a certain race could only live in certain demarcated neighborhoods. This form of zoning was struck down by the United States Supreme Court in 1917 in a case called Buchanan versus Worley. The prom most prominent form of zoning that emerged in the progressive era was called use zoning. And use zoning is simply the idea that you separate certain forms of uses within a municipal area or a metropolitan region. And the most kind of, I think, well-known example of this is separating, for example, industrial uses from residential uses. And use zoning became a municipal tool that was popularized as a replacement for nuisance law. 
so instead of relying, so for example, if you have um, an apartment building, let's say on um, in in Boston, in in Jamestown, in Charlestown, rather, and there is a smokestack next door to it that's belching soot into the apartment, you could sue for nuisance as a private nuisance, but it would be difficult to bring a claim and, and costly and, and time intensive, and it doesn't solve the immediate problem. So municipalities began using use sound zoning, especially since uh, a lot of factories in the industrial Midwest and Northeast were built into the heart of, of metropolitan areas. Use zoning was a way to try and it was a it was a proactive prof, prophylactic way of separating these kinds of uses, um, and so industrial uses, residential uses, commercial uses began separated through use zoning. And this form of zoning was upheld in a very famous case out of the Supreme Court in the 1930s called Euclid, not named after the ancient Greek mathematician, <laughs> but rather um, named after a suburb out of Cincinnati. So it's called Euclidean zoning. But what I want to draw your attention to is a third type of zoning. And these are my, again, these are heuristics. These are my terms, is what I call fiscal zoning. Um, these are not technical terms that you'll find in the urban studies literature per se. These are just, again, broad ways of describing these types of zoning. Fiscal zoning really emerges in the 1960s and accelerates in the 1970s and 80s. And the difference between use zoning and fiscal zoning is that whereas use zoning is really focused on separating certain kinds of uses, fiscal zoning becomes a mechanism for controlling development, development and specifically certain types of development that either increase the risk of outlays, so uh, public expense, or, or minimize those kinds of, uh, or rather maximize revenue. So for example, if, if a city is considering a certain kind of development, they might look at what sort of tax revenue, property tax revenue, um, or other forms of revenue, parcel taxes and so on, would be generated by that development. Or alternatively, what sort of costs would entail? For example, what sort of demands would be put on local infrastructure in terms of water, sewer hookup, electricity, uh, one of the, frankly, one of the larger costs of, de of development, especially for families, is education, right? And so if you have a large development where you anticipate there will be a lot of children, then you have to anticipate, well, are we going to have to build a new school? Are we going to have to expand our existing school? Are we going to have to hire teachers? I see a lot of you nodding, so this is, this is familiar. So fiscal zoning is the use of zoning to control development. And in particular, not just development, but to control, minimize fiscal costs and maximize revenues. And so what the problem that fiscal zoning has created is that fiscal zoning incentivizes uh, developments that produce the most revenue and minimize those that entail the most municipal costs. So I just wanted to go over that, that use of zoning has kind of evolved into fiscal zoning. And what happens is that cities compete against each other for residents, right? They're trying to do two things. They're trying to create economic activity, right? To lure businesses into, and at the macro scale, it looks like the Amazon HQ2 uh, competition, right? Where cities actually put in these formal proposals. In a micro level though, they're just trying to keep local businesses, spur local business, but also they're trying to, frankly, lure the wealthiest, most affluent and most capable citizens that will pay, you know, at the lowest effective tax rate, the highest local taxes and contribute to the community. And, and also frankly, keep out uh, people who will put on more demands on, on public services. So let me, let's move on. <laughs> so zoning and land use regulation are assumed to have effects. Otherwise would it be so ubiquitous? But it's kind of remarkable that when you actually look at the research studying the effects of zoning, there is very little empirical systematic research. So if you were to ask yourself, you know, what is the actual research demonstrate in terms of the effects of zoning, you can find very little. And there, there, there's a fundamental problem, which is there is just a lack of data. And the reason there is a lack of data, underlying data to, to analyze is because number one, there is no single comprehensive database or repository of zoning in the United States. It does not exist. Um, why is that? Well partly because of the second reason here. There is no universal standard for zoning classifications or base zoning formula from which such data may be derived. What does that mean? It's academic speak here, but what it basically means is that across the United States, uh, cities enact their own 
idiosyncratic and unique, both zoning ordinances as well as on the sh design their own shape files. So you, you essentially have to go into each municipal ordinance, study it to understand what it's saying. There are, of course, similarities. So you know, R1 is often you know, single family zoning of a certain lot size across the United States. But the truth is that once you dig into the details, every municipality does it its own way. So because there are over 30,000 municipalities that have their own idiosyncratic land use ordinances um, you, and zoning uh, shape files and so on, you have to study each one individually. Um, and so there's just no da database or index by which to compare it in a systematic way. Keep going. So where do you get data on zoning? Well, uh, I'll, I'll mention th there are a number of surveys that were begun in the late 1970s and, and early 1980s to study this issue, especially as fiscal zoning proliferated. Um, I'll mention a few of these from the uh, that were t undertaken in the 21st century. The first is this Brookings survey. It was a survey of 1,800 jurisdictions in the 50 largest metros. Now, <laughs> there they actually surveyed double that number. 1,800 were the actual number of jurisdictions that responded to the survey. Uh, the most famous survey instrument and database of zoning is the Wharton Res Residential Land Use uh, Regulatory Index, which was conducted in 2000. Well, it was compiled in 2006. It was com conducted over the pre preceding years. It was over 2,600 jurisdictions. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about this index later, but it's the most widely used in the empirical research and the economic and sociological research. More recently, the Urban Institute conducted another a, a large survey of 1,700 jurisdictions. And then here in California, the most important is the Turner Center survey of the Residential Land Use Survey it conducted in 2017 and 2018. And they surveyed almost 600 jurisdictions. There were 252 that actually replied. Um, that is probably the best, most California specific data point. Let's, let's keep going. So based upon these studies, here are some of the main findings. The first is Jonathan Rothwell, who is an economist at Gallup. He's a phenomenal economist. He found that uh, using the Turner survey, the Turner Center survey, Turner Center is an institute at UC Berkeley, um, that California cities with more restrictive zoning are more racially segregated. Specifically, he found that areas, meaning neighborhoods or municipalities with restrictive zoning have more white residents and fewer black and Latinx residents. So again, this is not the Bay Area specific, this is California wide. He found that citizen opposition to development also predicts the exclusion of black and Hispanic residents. And he found in Los Angeles, just to take one example in his report, rents are 32% higher and home values almost 40% higher in jurisdictions with the most stringent lot size requirements, meaning um, the largest lot sizes, um, the most, in you know, specific forms of, for example, setbacks, parking requirements, and so on, compared to jurisdictions that are more relatively lenient. Keep going. Jenny Schutz and her colleague Murray um, at the Urban Institute did a study with the Urban Survey and found similarly that cities nation nationwide with more restrictive zoning have fewer apartments and that compared to other states, the state of California produces very little multifamily housing because we have more restrictive zoning and land use policies. Keep going. Uh, Jessica Trunstein, who is a political scientist and a very well-regarded one at University uh, of California Merced, used the 2006 Wharton Regulatory Land Use Index to conduct a study which she uh, reported in, I forget the journal, in, in January of 2020. And she found, similarly, that cities that were whiter in 1970, around the time that the Fair Housing Act, the National Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act uh, took effect, have more restrictive land use policies in 2006. And she found that cities with more restrictive land use policy were whiter than their metropolitan areas in 2011, even after controlling for their racial demographics in 1970. So what that suggests is that the more the more restrictive land use policies that were enacted after the Fair Housing Act actually continue to maintain that racial exclusivity, uh, even in the face of the Fair Housing Act and even controlling for their initial demographics in 1970. 
She found that cities that were forced that, that confronted fair housing suits or were forced to liberalize have slightly less residential segregation and also slightly, uh, therefore, slightly less restrictive land use policy. And she found that white residents tend to be more supportive of restricted land use policy than non-white residents, using, again, the, the national survey. Keep going. So this is, it's, it's important to point out that the research I've just described is the basically the extent of the research that exists on the effects of land use policy. Um, and again, I presented the data sources. The problems with this research are that, number one, the underlying data is all survey-based. And a close inspection of the survey results show that there are systematic flaws in the research. Now, the critics of the research will say there are systematic flaws in, the, in just errors, but the, the research suggests that actually the surveys underestimate the restrictiveness of land use that was studied. So for example, the Turner survey, the Turner survey asks um, broad categorical questions of the city planners or city planning departments that were responded to the survey. So for example, it asks questions like, what percentage of residential land or land in your city is single family zoning? Zero to 25%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, 75% to 100%, right? So broad, categor broad categorical answers. Or for example, how long does it take start to finish from an approval to actual built development? Zero to one year, one to two years, two to three years, and so on. And what the research shows is that the survey respondents to the Turner survey after looking at a handful of cities to ground truth this, that the survey respondents in these planning departments or in these cities systematically underestimated approval timelines, public opposition to development, and the percentage or degree of restrictive zoning in their un own jurisdiction. Underestimated. Um, um, and also, as I said before, this, the survey response responses were incomplete, right? 52% response rate to the Turner survey, which I think is actually a good, a good high response rate, but it's just, it's, it's not complete. It's, it's not comprehensive. All right, let's keep going. So I, I wanted you to understand that data to understand what we did. What we did in the Bay Area and what we are going to do for the state of California is we are pulling every municipal zoning ordinance directly. We are um, reaching out to the cities and and um, we are downloading the shape files and actually studying uh, satellite data and planned development areas to identify actual zoning and built environment. In, in We did this for 101 municipalities in the Bay Area. Um, keep going, I'm just gonna skip over this. Keep going. And we actually published the results. Can you, you can go back up one slide. We published static maps of every city in the Bay Area on our website here. Um, and then we also, next slide, we actually created an interactive map, a dynamic map where you can click, you can zoom to the city and you can see actually the zoning that we've studied. Now, we only looked at three basic zoning categories rather than the you know plethora of, of zoning that actually exists. Go to the next screen. We looked at three things. We looked at non-residential zoning, we looked at single family residential, and then other residential. Um, I, I don't know if you can see the bottom of this slide. The bottom is covered up for me. Um, let me see if I can get that to show up. Barely. Uh, so what we did for every city is we calculated the percentage of single family zoning that in each residential area. And as I said, we haven't done this for the Sacramento region yet, but we are going to do it for the rest of the state. And what we found at the level of the Bay Area region, the nine county region, which includes Napa, Sonoma, uh, you know, Contra Costa, not just Alameda or San Francisco or Santa Clara counties, is that 85% of the residential land in the San Francisco Bay Area, the nine county Bay Area, is exclusively, exclusively reserved for single family zoning. In other words, only 15% of residential land permits by uh, zoning ordinance, denser multifamily housing options. That doesn't mean that there weren't variances or uh, m or mixed use areas where, where uh, residential 
homes have been built. But according to the zoning ordinances alone, only 15% of the land is permits multifamily housing, which is clearly a significant problem for a region that's the vanguard of the American economy and which many people are trying to, to move to, to find uh, work and jobs. Um, not to mention for the residents who live in these areas, right, who can't afford homes. Um, and so I just have one example here. This is Concord, which is a, a suburb in uh, Contra Costa County. And we did, we did this again for every city in the Bay Area. Uh, next screen. So this is the, the Bay Area zoning map. It's on our website that shows the 85% single family zoning in the entire region. Keep going. Now, it's not just that there is a enormous percentage of single family zoning that we actually were able to run statistical analyses of, uh, of this pattern and then study the presumed effects or at least the correlates. But this, before I show you some of that, this is a table that shows all the cities, well, a large number of the cities in the Bay Area and how they fall in terms of the percentage of single family zoning that they have um, with a range of 40 to 75%, 75 to 90%, 90 to 100%. And my guess is that if we were to study the cities in your area, they would probably be distributed in your region roughly the same across these categories. Um, the more kind of urbanized, large urban cities fall into the left-hand uh, column of the table and the inner ring suburbs like Berkeley as well. Um, but probably there would be fewer in the far left column and more in the, the center and right column if we were to do this for the, the Sacramento region. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the correlations we found? Uh, we found, this was, this was the, uh, the slide, the infographic, that, or chart rather, that the line graph that we created that got the most attention by, uh, on social media and um, in, in just media in general, the journalists were interested in. What we found, again, this is not a sample because we studied uh, every city in the Bay Area, that as you increase the percentage of single family zoning in a neighborhood or in a city, it essentially becomes entirely white and Asian. And as you increase that percentage, so you can see in the far right hand side of this line graph, that uh, as you get to approach 100% single family zoning, the percentage of African American and Latin X, which are the purple and um, dark gray lines, go to zero. And the, the the percentage white. I hope that you all can see the legend for this slide. In my <laughs> in my use of yeah. Zoom, the box great is is covered up by the um, the task bar. Um, it, it becomes basically all white and Asian. And so what this is really demonstrating is that yes, single family zoning has a clear racial effect, imputed effect, certainly a strong racial correlation. Keep going. So what are our main findings? I don't have time to get into all of them, but we found that cities with the highest level of single family zoning have greater resources, even relative to the generally wealthy and expensive Bay Area in virtually every statistic we were able to measure. So you can find this in part five and the other single family zoning report in our series on segregation in the Bay Area. We found that these cities have higher incomes, per capita income, they have higher home values, they have better performing schools in terms of uh, test scores using national and state level uh, test metrics. We also compared it with the Opportunity Atlas that was created by uh, Ross Chetty, which I'm gonna talk a little, about, a little bit about in a minute. And children who were raised in those cities 30 years ago have better income outcomes as adults as measured by income. But we also found a, a a very troubling pattern of social, economic, and racial exclusion in cities with high levels of single family zoning. Um, keep going. So this is a bit technical, but um, remember the, the table I showed you earlier that categorizes cities into the three columns, 40 to 75% single family zoning. This is, that's replicated here, but it, here we actually have the percentage by race for, um, each of those categories. So you can see, for example, that as you increase, again, increase the percentage of single family zoning, the percentage white goes up in the Bay Area. And by the way, white in the in the Bay Area is only 40% of the population. So the Bay Area is not like a 50 to 60% white region. It's a 40% white region. But in the cities that have 90 to 100% single family zoning, it's 
the overall average is 53% white. Um, but the most important thing I wanted to point out here is the relationship between racial segregation and zoning. So we use a measure of racial segregation called the divergence index. Now I don't have time to get into the nuances of divergence versus other measures of segregation, but divergence is we think the best measure of segregation because it allows you to measure segregation holistically, um, looking at multiple racial groups simultaneously. And what we clearly found here is that both overall aggregate racial divergence scores go up. It's the second row in the table, divergence from the Bay Area. Uh, anything over about 0.12 divergence score is considered highly segregated. So what it means is that once you get to 75% single family zoning in an area, segregation becomes high and it's, it's, it's moderate to high. Um, and then within city segregation um, is a different measure of divergence, but basically it becomes the, the um, the divergence score actually goes down, which means the it's the segregation of people between neighborhoods in a city once you get to 100% single family zoning. And the reason is because cities are racially homogenous or homogeneous um, once you get to a high level of single family zoning. So the neighborhoods become, for example, all white or all white and Asian. So our research shows systematically that there is a strong relationship between racial, not just economic segregation, but racial segregation and zoning. So I, I know this is taking a little bit longer. Let me explain why, why this is, if we can move forward. Uh, geez, I don't really think I have time to go through this slide. So let, let me just keep going, keep going. I'm not going to go. This is, I was going to do a, pre, a slight presentation on structural racism here, but I, I don't have time to get into this. So keep going. Keep going. Okay, stop here. Sorry, if you uh, could go can back. I, can, I, can I interrupt you for just one second? Uh, Lynette or James, do we actually have time for him to do the complete presentation? Because this is particularly interesting to me, at least. And I'd hate to have it sort of shortchanged if we have available time. I, I certainly think we could uh, definitely provide at least another 15 minutes because we're going to want to do Q&A. So okay. we, have, we have cleared this agenda to be able to have the time. So um, Director okay. Stephen, I think, you know. Let's, let's back up then a couple of slides. <laughs> the, the economic, I didn't quite read the whole slide, but the economic piece of this, the mobility piece, economic mobility, I think is of great interest. Yes. Okay. Along Let's go game. back. <clears throat> go back a little bit more. Okay. Stop here. So I mentioned Roz Chetty's research. Roz Chetty is an economist who was at Stan Harvard, then Stanford, back at Harvard, um, who has basically done one of the most innovative uh, research studies in economics in the last 10 years. And it's not so much that he's brilliant, although he is, but he actually secured an agreement with the IRS to get tax records from every American to study their income changes over the life cycle. So he has a data set that includes every American born between, I believe, 1980 and 1986. And what he does is he studies the parent income of the children born between 1980 and 1986. And then he studies their income, both in absolute terms and in percentile terms as adults. Okay, I hope you're with me so far. So this data set includes, I think it's around 40 million Americans. Um, so to establish or explain this, this research, what he does is he divides in, in either percentile terms, he divides income into percentiles or quintiles. So a percentile is obviously one, a single percent within the income distribution. A simpler way of thinking about it is in terms of, of quintiles. So let me explain this premise. If in the United States, opportunity were equal, uh-oh, I just got a notification to install the latest uh, Windows updates, let me snooze this. <laughs> um, if opportunity were equal, children born anywhere in the income distribution would have an equal chance of landing anywhere as adults, right? So for example, 
if, if we just think of the income distribution in terms of quintiles, first quintile down to the fifth quintile or first to, to fifth, um, if you were born in the top 20%, you should have, if, it were, if opportunity were truly equal, you should have an equal chance of, of landing in the top as in the bottom as an adult. Unfortunately, as you may surmise, that's not the case in the United States. What actually happens is that children born in the bottom in income quintile, only 7.5% of those children actually make it to the top instead of that 20%, um, which is less than five times the chance of those born in the top, which means that if you're born in the top income quintile, you have about a 40% chance of staying there as an adult, right? Because you go to good schools, you probably, your parents probably had the income or wealth to help you matriculate into a college or university, which creates human capital and education that will allow you to get um, an occupation or career that has a higher level of income and so on. Okay, so we are actually able to study this now using uh, population level data. So next slide. What the race data shows is that this is the this is the this is phenomenally important to understanding structural racism in the United States. I think it's most important disparity. And I, but there's I'll show you the disparities in almost every other aspect of life. If you are born into the bottom income quintile as a child, the bottom 20% of income earners, your chances of staying there as an adult if you are black is 51%. Your chances of making it to the top are 3%. Now, remember I said the average in the United States is 7.5%. The American dream, right? Being born into poverty or the bottom 20% and making it to the top is 7.5% nationally. If you're black, it's only 3%. Now, look at the, call, at the uh, chart on the right. This is for whites. If you're born into the bottom income quintile, your chance of live, staying there is 23%, and your chance of making it to the top is 16%. This is basically... For white Americans, the American dream. This is equal opportunity. Remember how I said, if opportunity were equal, no matter where you are born in the income distribution, your chances of landing somewhere else should be about 20%. For white Americans, this is true. Landing somewhere else should be Americans. This I'm hearing myself. I got a little bit of feedback for a second. Um, so... So this is, this is basically the American dream exists for white Americans, but for black Americans, it clearly does not. Now, why might this be the case? And I, I have a slide on other racial disparities later, but let me explain why this occurs. Next slide. Next slide. The main reason is because of place. Place actually turns out to be, if you could go back one slide, Place actually tends, turns out to be, using the, the Chetty data set, the key determinant of where people end up in the income distribution as an, an adult. And we can, the, the, the Chetty data actually allows us to disaggregate um, the place-based research because, again, he's, he's looking at, place has a causal effect. So he's able to look at where people grow up and what percentage of time they spent there as children. And so, for example, he's able to see that when kids move to a different place, what effect does that place effect have and he's able to make a causal inference because of this reason reason he's able to look at sibling pairs in families so for example if you move yeah, from one mm -hmm. pamela i think i can hear you oh there you go you were on um you when you see siblings move from one city to another and let's say one child is four and the other is 13 you're able to observe the difference effects as adults, which means that you can draw causal inferences about the place. Um, and the main thing that we have found is that um, certain places have different levels of racial, uh, sorry, of overall upper, upward and economic mobility. Um, so keep going. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a, in a moment, what the place effect is. But basically there are three geographic levels that shape upward mobility. The first is the local jurisdiction, the second is the neighborhood, and the third is the metropolitan region. Um, 
the Chetty data actually allows us to assign a percentage effect to each of these geographic levels. So just thinking about it, for, in, in, through an example, suppose you grew up in the Detroit region. The Detroit region in the 1950s was an economically booming region. By the 1990s, uh, you know, is in immense economic decline, right? And but you might live in a, an affluent white suburb that you know still has economic vitality in the Detroit region, and you might live in a strong neighborhood with great schools in that region. So these are nested geographies that shape your life outcome. Next slide. So I've put in the percentage effects of each of these categories using the Chetty data. The Chetty data finds that the local municipal jurisdiction you live in has a 28% chance on, in terms of the variation in upward, uh, sorry, explains 28% of the variation in upward mobility. The neighborhood explains 30, 27% and the region explains 32%. So if you live in a region that has strong economic, you know, uh, activity in a, in a high quality uh, municipality with great schools, great uh, health and safety programs and a neighborhood that has you know, all the amenities that you want, your chances of, of having upward mobility, a good outcome as an adult are very good. Even if you live in a single parent home in a, in a high, you know, in a, where your parents earn below the poverty line. So this is controlling for all the other factors, you know, including family, family configuration, income, education of the parents. That these other forces overwhelm these fixed personal characteristics and malleable per personal characteristics. You know, they account for uh, this percentage of upward mobility. Keep going. So why is place so powerful and why does it have a race effect, not just an income effect? Well, this is a famous redlining map, um, which Dove described in the last meeting. Keep going. Past redlining and other land use policies and, po and other governmental policies have produced racial residential segregation. I don't have time to describe this map in too much detail, but we created segregation maps for the entire Bay Area. The darker census tracts here are census tracts that have the highest levels of segregation for Alameda County. And we created one of these for all nine counties in the Bay Area. The fundamental problem, the fundamental problem that upward mobility, the reason upward mobility is much lower by race is because racial residential segregation is greater than economic segregation in the United States. I'm gonna repeat that. Racial residential segregation is greater than economic segregation. In the last meeting, or the meeting, meeting that I uh, listened to, there was a brief discussion about, is this just economic, right? That people who can afford to live in certain neighborhoods and certain cities, you know, are able to move into those cities and those cities have better schools, you know, and so on and so forth. It's not that simple because lower income whites and middle income whites actually find their way into higher opportunity communities. Whereas upper income and middle income African-Americans live in lower opportunity communities. So racial residential segregation is actually the primary mechanism that causes structural racism, these racist effects. And the reason is, the reason is because racial residential segregation is stronger than economic segregation. Now, if you talk to a sociologist, they might say, well, in the last 40 years, residential segregation has declined and economic segregation has increased. Depending on the measure, that is a true statement. But what that statement overlooks is that even if economic segregation and economic stratification is increasing, racial residential segregation is still at an overall aggregate higher level than economic segregation in the United States. To put it simply, the United States and California are and remain deeply racially segregated. And there are lots of reasons for this. I don't have time to get into all of them, but part of them is the effects of the past, that government policy has that segregated people by race continues to persist into the present. And in fact, keep going, I'm gonna show you, we found that in the nine county Bay Area, seven of the nine counties have more segregation in 2010 than in 1970. So it's not, they are more segregated in 2010 than 1970. And again, 1968 is when the Federal Fair Housing Act was enacted and it went into effect in 1970. Um, keep going. This is a chart that 
that shows the nine county Bay Area. And what I want to just draw your attention to are these um, lines at the bottom. Um, some of the cities, like some of the counties like Napa County have a quintupled their level of segregation. So the rural wider counties actually have the largest increases in segregation. So I share that because the, the counties that probably most resemble the counties in your area, I'm speculating here, but I suspect that if I were to study the counties in your area, we would find mostly increases in segregation in that 40 year period. And once we get the 2020 census, we'll be able to extrapolate this to the present. Um, but contrary to the narrative that racial segregation has decreased, actually that's not the case. As I said, seven of the nine counties have an increase in segregation. You can see both the data and the line chart here that demonstrates that. Which means that structural racism, <laughs> not declining, is actually becoming more intense as we come to the future because our regions are sorting people on the basis of class and race into higher and lower opportunity communities, neighborhoods, and regions. I'm almost done, keep going. So I probably should have showed this earlier, um, but racial disparities are visible basically along any dimension of well-being: education, employment, health, income, wealth, incarceration. Um, and so these are the effects of not just you know, income outcomes, but these are the effects of structural, what sometimes people call systemic racism. But the cause of it is the location where people grow up and live and all the associated effects, the, the resources that exist in those communities, the peer relationships, the social capital, the human capital, and, and much more. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. These are just, just disparities, that sh disparities that exist between white and black Americans along all of the key indicators of well-being. But I think the most important was the data on upward mobility. And there's also data on downward mobility, which I didn't include, um, and much, much more data besides. Keep going. Is that it? Is that the end? OK. We finally hit the end. <laughs> so thank you so much for your patience. I hope this was clear. I'm happy to try and answer any questions you may have. I realize that's a lot of content in a very short amount of time. Ideally, I would have had, you know, three days or three months in a course to, to deconstruct this, but I hope that's what you're looking to hear. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, um, Stephen. I know there are questions. So um, if somebody has got a question, you can put the question, um, raise your hand. Um, certainly uh, has gotten us thinking, and especially as we think about um, housing and moving forward, um, meeting our arena numbers and knowing that we have housing needs, um, it really gets us to the question of like, then how do we make changes to allow for um, more opportunity for people to have access to home ownership, um, et cetera. But I'm gonna, you might think about that question, um, and I'm going to take David Sanders' question first. So, Director Sanders, if you want to ask your question, yeah, I mean, it's going to be hard to ask just uh, just one. Um, I do want to thank the speaker, though, for sort of confirming in the minds of many how much government planning has sort of wrecked our uh, our cities and our uh, development patterns. That's that's half joke, half serious, but. Um, you know, I, I saw in your early data there, you were looking at uh, a 15% multifamily as sort of a Bay Area average. And I'm curious as to what's the goal. And my yeah. primary concern about that data was uh, accounting for density. You know, if you look at single family homes, that can be one house on a two acre lot zoned that way, or it can be 15 houses on an acre. So, I mean, that's a factor of 30 in density. Um, forcing it down to single family home versus multifamily. I'm not sure that that actually yields what you're, what you're looking for there. Um, in addition, I would be worried about uh, the actual value of the unit. It seems like there's a, a lot more factors to consider than just that, that really crude measurement of, um, of what percent is multifamily versus, versus residential. Yeah. Uh, honestly, uh, I'm not sure where to begin to answer that that sort of uh, ball of questions. Um, I guess I'll start with with this. So we all know that there are different housing there is a housing crisis, right? But I think depending on who you're speaking with, there's a different definition of what that crisis is. 
So uh, when I was doing my, I, I've done a, a, just an inordinate number of talks on Zoom in the last 12 months. But um, when I did the talk that I had mentioned before for the Florida Realtors Association, I identified five different housing crises. The most obvious housing crisis is the, just the lack of affordable housing in our regions. And that came up in the last meeting that I heard. You know, talking, someone described a development that, that they were involved in and how none of that housing is going to be affordable, even though it's a little bit more dense. Um, the second housing crisis is just a lack of production overall. So at all income levels, and, and RENA implicates that. A third housing crisis is displacement and gentrification. A fourth housing crisis, if you're concerned about it, is climate. And a fifth housing crisis, I think from my perspective, the most important is the persistence of racial residential segregation. So what I say is that depending on depending on how you define the crisis and what your goal is will shape what your policy response is. Which of those crises, if any, are you focused on? I, you know, you didn't, David, you didn't art specifically articulate which, cri which of those crises you're focused on, but I could infer maybe you're trying to figure out how can we make more affordable housing? Um, well, if you're trying to build affordable housing and you're not trying to solve these other problems, then you can identify a set of policies that can help advance that goal. Right, that can help you meet that objective, but they won't necessarily help you solve these other problems. Right. So, for example, if you're just focused on affordable housing, then you could implement a set of policies. For example, create more uh, state subsidies for affordable housing, right, and then plan for affordable housing. But just having more affordable housing at a certain income level is not actually going to help you solve the overall production crisis, nor is it going to integrate necessarily lead to integration or reduce displacement and gentrification. In fact, it could exacerbate displacement and gentrification because you might be redeveloping land that is currently you know, allocated for affordable housing. So I, I, these problems are incredibly complex. There's no silver bullet, but I think the answer to the simple, the, the simple question of what do we do depends on what your goal is and you need to have clarity on the goal. Now, you, the other thing you raised was about how our study just looked at zoning um, uh, and single family zoning and the relationship between price and so on. Um, yes, our study just looked at zoning. And what again, we found that only 15% of residential land is zoned to permit, you know, by the zoning uh, ordinance, denser multifamily housing options. Um, uh, I, so, uh, so, what do I want to say here? What I want to say is that um, density by itself does not mean affordability, right? And I think that example came up again in the example of your last call. Um, I'm sorry, you asked so many different questions. Why don't I just stop and give you a chance to take another bite of the apple? <laughs> and I'll try and I'll try and more clearly answer the questions you had. Uh, that, that's okay. I think I'll move on from there. Um, you know, the correlation causation issues here are, yeah. are significant. You you referenced some of those. I'm a scientist, so that it's a for sure particular interest to me. And you so, know, the interchangeability of wealth and race in a lot of the analysis, I think, is is hard for a lot of people on this call to get. And I should say most of us on on this particular in this particular meeting were not present at the previous discussion. Okay. So this is a, a first time exposure for the majority of people on this call to what you're talking about. Yes. But if you can say um, a little more with regard to that, because what people sure. are going to say is, you know, we don't we don't really see in our community that we're being, uh, you know, discriminatory in some way and holding people back from economic opportunity. People have the option to, you know, live wherever they want, wherever they can afford. And then wealth becomes. Yes. The main determinant, not so, not. Race. So. So there's a lot lot to say there, but. Um, as a general baseline matter, there is a racial wealth gap in the United States, and it's about 13 or 12 to 1, meaning that white families have about 12 to 13 times as much wealth on average as black families. And as Dove described at the last meeting, part of the reason for that is that federal policy and local policies and state policies in the post-war era restricted where African Americans could live and therefore accumulate wealth through home ownership. Both it restricted their ability to own homes, and and, and the post-war boom, you know, African Americans in downtown Detroit, a home in downtown Detroit, uh, you know, 
gained much less home value. In fact, you could buy or sell a home for like 15,000 in Detroit even today compared to the suburbs of Detroit. And that's true basically across the United States. In terms of the correlation versus causation issue, I did try to articulate where we were running statistical correlation versus where we actually were able to identify a causality. And the Chetty study uh, used a number of controls uh, including sibling pairs to study the causal effects of place. So that is clearly established. The study we conducted, we it's true, it's only correl correlates, but there are two additional factors that suggest that there is an underlying causal pattern. The first is that all of the research, all of the studies that have looked at this point in the same direction, right? That's why I presented the Rothwell study, the Schutz study, the Trunstein study, and then our research. The fact that there's a systematic uh, direction, the systematic set of findings, in, empirical findings in the same direction suggests that there is an underlying causal relationship. Of course, there could be some other um, cause. I would suggest that you're right in surmising that it probably is the racial wealth gap, but the racial wealth gap is exacerbated um, by some of these policies. In terms of the question of um, going back to the question of intent versus you know effects, what I call structural racism is not caused by racist actors. Rather, it's caused by institutional arrangements that when overlaid on historical policies continue to perpetuate racialized outcomes. And so that's why I set up the, the conversation by distinguishing between racial zoning, use zoning, and fiscal zoning. When cities engage in fiscal zoning, where they, for example, require a minimum lot size of an acre and a half and low density, they're engaging in fiscal zoning, right? And there may be reasons they're doing that, but the underlying, what we have found in our research is that basically residents of American regions want several things. They want high quality home, they want you know, large homes and, and, and great homes in high quality communities and neighborhoods that have great schools with the lowest effective tax rates. And what cities want is they want to be able to balance their budgets, right? And especially in a period of, of you know, fiscal distress for the state. Now, the state's fiscal situation appears to have dramatically <laughs> been revised. Last July, there was a $54, $54 billion California state budget deficit projected, which is just, I mean, terrifying when we think about what that, you know, what that could mean for cities and localities. But it's clear that cities have strong incentives to try and maximize economic, economic activity and to lure more affluent and wealthy residents because, number one, they can um, draw residents that will provide the most tax tax base revenue and tax tax base capacity, and number two, minimize outlays and demands on you know the city's uh, treasury. So that that competition, that municipal municipal competition, results in um, in zoning that is more restrictive and more exclusionary. It's not necessarily exclusionary in terms of intent, but it's clearly exclusionary in terms of effects. And the data that, that you know, the systematic um, analysis that we conducted in the Bay Area shows that to be the case, that the, the communities that have the highest percentage of single family zoning have the lowest percentage of black and Latinx residents and so on and so forth. So it's not intent, but it's clearly the effect. And these kind of fiscal imperatives that municipalities engage in continue to produce exclusionary effects. And we can debate, you know, the causal mechanisms underlying the outcomes, but the policy effects I think are pretty clear. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and take a few more questions. Um, Director Kozlowski. I'd actually um, like to let Michael Saragosa go before me because I a lot of my question has been answered, but I'd like to circle back after he asks his. Thank you. Uh, just, it, it's more of a comment, I think, and I, we kind of had this in the Policy and Innovation Committee um, when we had uh, sort of the, the pre-look um, uh, pre at this. And that, you know, for me, when I look at, because I really, I wanted to dial this back down to what our goals are, and that is affordability of, of housing in our region and, um, and how race and equity play into that. But, you know, one of the concerns that I have is, that when we talk about affordability and we talk about density, you know, we start talking about apartments and rental housing. 
And you don't build generational wealth on that. And I, you know, when you talk about the racial disparities, a lot of that goes back to home ownership and the ability for people to transfer property from generation to generation and that ability to create that wealth so that you do, you start to see that income disparity between ethnicities. Um, you know, I have a problem as Latino, and again, I, and I hate the term Latinx, I know it's used in academia as well as in corporate. I have clients that use it, but don't use it at all, just as a, as a, as a stand aside. I, don't, I think it's an anglicization of, of, the, of the language. Anyhow, as a side, um, I, I do think that as we look at affordability, we do need to look at that ownership angle of it, because if we want to get to the point we're going to start erasing those disparities, you got to get people into where they can afford to buy a house. If they're paying $2,000 a month for rent, we really aren't we're getting somebody into housing, but is it truly affordable? And is it gonna allow that next generation to, to build that uh, wealth transfer? So I, I'm, I'm interested to hear anything along those, those lines, yeah. because I think that's to me the heart of it where we start getting Latinos and we start getting African-Americans into that uh, home ownership and that, and that gap can come down. So I wanna just stipulate that I agree with basically everything you said, including uh, I dislike the term Latinx as well. Uh, um, um, but so there is a but. I agree with everything you said. It's absolutely true that home ownership is is perhaps the mechanism by which we begin addressing with these racial wealth gaps. And here's the but. I think even more important than addressing that is getting children of color into high opportunity environments where investments in human capital and social capital will allow them to have economic and social mobility as young adults. And so as between the two options of getting a, a low income, let's say child of color into a high opportunity area that has an apartment or not having them move there at all, I would prefer the former to the latter. Because that, even more than their, parent, their parents accumulating wealth through property ownership, is going to propel them into a better set of outcomes as an adult. So I'm not a policymaker. I don't have to make that choice. <laughs> um, but I think actually that's the priority. Second, secondary should be helping those families bid, build wealth. But the most important priority is the long-term goal of helping those kids uh, and basically doing human human capital investments in those children. Thank you. Um, Director Kozalski, did you come back to your question? Yeah, thank you very much. So so I, I had similar questions about, you know, sort of the how do you how do you solve the underlying wealth issue and how do you distinguish cause from you know sort of corollary? Um, but let me ask a, a, a discrete question. Um, does, does your finding make an argument for zoning classifications to be specifically temporal and have an expiration date effectively so that somebody moving to a place knows that for some certain period of time, their house lot that they purchased is going to be zoned R1, but there will be a date in the future when the highest and best use of that land may be something else and it will expire and it will become multifamily or other things like that. And then the second question that I have is just, I, I'm from the, I lived in the Detroit area for a good long time. So I am intimately familiar with how that place has, you know, ebbed and flowed with history. Um, and my question is, is, California, anywhere in California, actually um, a good model for national zoning issues for metropolitan areas because in effect, we have, we have raised the expectations on every front um, for what, a, what an excellent community is in terms of the, the school facilities, the park amenities, the quality of construction, the sensitivity to environmental issues and all manner of things that ultimately add cost to development that we have solar panels development in that way and choked yeah. it off 
rather than looking at some place like Detroit, which doesn't have quite the same sorts of restrictions. So I think you probably need to level set California being the, as a state, a rich suburb compared to most of the world. So just FYI. Well, well those are a lot of interesting comments and questions. Um, let me try and break them down and remember them all. So sure. the first is in terms of the pol what sort of policy recommendations in terms of land use does our uh, does our study suggest? I'm going to get to that. The second was about sunset provisions. I just want to say there's a general policy matter. I actually really like sunset provisions. I think it's too bad that we don't enact, you know, a local or state government does not enact enough laws that have sunset provisions that have it because they just, we need to reevaluate policies on a, on a community base. I think it's a good, a good policy approach. Um, and then the third point is about California as a state versus the rest of the nation. Um, where should I start? So the, so what exactly are the policy implications of our study? Let me start by saying that our study does not suggest that single family homes are a problem. Rather, what it suggests is that single family zoning is a problem. And so in a, in a mixed commercial zone or in a multifamily or let's say other residential zone, you could have single family homes. There's nothing that bars single family homes in these other zones per se. What I think our study suggests is the simple conclusion that single family zoning as a form of zoning is excessive in California. And I, again, we're gonna expand the Bay Area study statewide, but it's just excessive in the sense I, I, that there Stephen, is- I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you on that, on that particular point. Um, I, the larger comment or question that I have related to that though, is that if the cost of developing any sort of um, dwelling unit is the same, the incentives for developers to build multifamily yes. are difficult to uh, rationalize. So, so ultimately, you got to have two things. You got to have a zoning modification yes. to allow for denser development of one sort or another, and you also have to lessen the burden so that the economic prospects of somebody putting capital into a project that is multifamily um, makes sense. Yes, th this is clearly very complicated. And I'm trying to keep it simple by focusing on one element at a time. So I'm focusing not on the actual, you know, production of development, but I'm just focusing on zoning itself first. So th the, the clear policy implication of the study is, this, is that single family zoning as a zoning ordinance form is overused and excessive. And that cities in the Bay Area, but probably regions in the state need to l loosen up that form of zoning and permit, you know, more uh, development types across our, our region and our state. Now, just loosening up zoning, we know, does not result in more development. It, the kinds of, Rena shows that just because you zone doesn't mean something's built. Things have to pencil out. Now, uh, there's two assumptions that I'll, I'll, I'll present and make explicit in terms of actually building more affordable housing. The first is, the assumption is that there is research to suggest that, um, you know, that denser housing options, not universally, but tend to be more affordable on a per unit basis. So if you, part of it is because just the cost of acquisition of the land is a huge part of the cost of development, right? So if you buy one parcel and you build one unit on it, a single family home, that's going to be more expensive on a per capita basis than if you build uh, 12 units on that same land. Now, it might not pencil, it might not be as affordable as we hope, right? You might be turning a $2 million home, potential home into a, you know, $400,000 condo, which is certainly not affordable. It's, you know, that's starter home value in, in, in the Bay Area. Um, so what you, this is, when it comes to the policy discussion, I think the policy is a particularly complicated because policymakers are looking for silver bullets. There are no silver bullets here. We focus on zoning to show the relationship between zoning and racial exclusion, but that doesn't mean, and we go into this in detail in part five of our series, 
you know, 10,000 words. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't convey that here. Just zoning for de greater density is not going to produce more affordable developments. You have to, what typically, what municipalities typically do is they will pair, uh, they will pair certain subsidies together to try and make a, a development pencil out, right? So you can pair, for example, um, credits that a developer might have like LIHTC with federal credits and private grants and foundation money. So there are different ways to kind of like kind of, you know, make these things come we're, together we're, to pencil yeah, out. We're all intimately familiar with that. Um, but th those in and of themselves are barriers also. You've answered my question, I guess, is okay. why I was stopping you. And I am grateful for your presentation. It was, it really is fascinating work and thank you. Just the, th I do want to get to the, the third question you raised though, which is that, um, so the only reason I talked about Detroit a couple of times is because it's such an interesting contrast, right? Of this region that boomed and has been in sharp decline in the Bay Area. The Bay Area, I like to think of sort of in the last 30 years as sort of Detroit of the 1950s, 1940s and 50s, just a you know booming air, area, vanguard of the, econo of the American economy. Uh, I do not think, I do think that there are very sharp differences between California and the rest of the country. But what California has in common with the rest of the country are two key features. The first is persistent and strong racial residential segregation. The country and California look very similar in that regard. The second is excessive, restrictive, and single family zoning. California and the rest of the country are uh, very similar in that regard. I do not believe and would never want to suggest that simply rolling back the degree of single family zoning will result in, any, in achieving any of the goals that you may have, the five goals I listed. But I do believe that it's impossible to achieve any of those goals with so much single family zoning. So the way that I put it in our report and when I speak about it with journalists is that rolling back restrictive zoning is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to solving any of these problems. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, Director Ferricks, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, Stephen, appreciate so much your uh, presentation this morning. Um, uh, uh, just a, a quick question. I'm not, you know, so first of all, um, there's a lot obviously <laughs> packed in uh, uh, into what you presented. Um, a question with regard to another, I think, a, a point, but also a question. Another issue that I, we, there are certainly at least in the Sacramento region, but there exists in the Bay Area and exists all over California and frankly all over the country are in many cases are the uh, also, uh, so in addition to the issues around single family zoning uh, and, and sort of R1 zoning, there's also frankly a lot of ballot blocks planning going on. Yes. Uh, urban growth boundaries. Yes. Uh, I mean, just in, here in the region, even in my own county, three or four of the jurisdictions have some sort of uh, urban growth boundary or, you know, uh, to every, every gr growth, potential external sort of um, peripheral growth measure goes to the ballot, that kind of thing. Um, have you guys looked at that at, that at all? Yes, I mean, I absolutely. Fire separate, you know, sort of uh, hornet's nest, but would pr appreciate your thoughts on, on those issues. I think it just, it adds to obviously the um, sort of severity of the situation. I'm, I'm glad you raised that question. Um, I want to answer in two ways. The first is that the Turner survey, so the, my very first slide framed the issue and the, <laughs> the cover slide of the presentation framed it not in terms of zoning, but in terms of land use. Um, I would consider those kind of like regulatory controls, right? Um, approval processes, all these things as, as land use controls. Um, you could even talk about Article 34, which requires local approval for affordable housing in California. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is that um, researchers have studied Houston, Texas. And the reason Houston is an interesting municipal case is because Houston is the only major city in the country that does not actually have zoning. <laughs> but when you look at Houston, it actually has very similar patterns to the rest of the country. So, you know, there are some people out there who just think we just need to roll back zoning and we'll solve these problems. Houston shows that's not the case. And the reason is because in lieu of zoning, Houston has in place a number of regulatory land use controls that function like zoning. So it has, you know, these sorts of, you know, all these different mechanisms that you're you're familiar with, that produce roughly the same effects. So, again, this goes back to the point I just made: rolling back excessive zoning is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. What we need to do 
is more generally is, is roll back these other regulatory controls as well, or we're not going to be able to develop. So I don't, look, our study focused on, in the our study, the study that I presented focused on single family zoning and racial segregation, right? And racial exclusion. Um, but zoning is only one piece of this larger puzzle. And I don't want to suggest that, that just solving zoning is gonna solve all these problems. It will not, <laughs> right? Because there are these other regulatory controls that produce, that are layered onto zoning that produce similar effects. So I think you're, I'm not a policymaker. I don't have to deal with the complexity of it. I can just, you know, tease these apart one piece at a time, but you're absolutely right. These other regulatory controls are perhaps just as important and perhaps in some contexts may be more important than zoning. Thank, thank you, really appreciate it, thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Menendian. I think you've certainly gotten us all thinking. Uh, we clearly see that there is not a silver, silver bullet uh, in addressing these issues, but it's, you know, zoning is one piece of the puzzle that, that we as jurisdictions have really got to grapple with. But I, I got a number of texts from folks saying this has been really interesting. It has been, um, and we will continue to have conversations just about housing. And as we talk about housing this next year, what are the things that we can do to, to what, what other tools, what can we do to try to move the needle forward in providing um, housing that's more equitable, more for sale product for people to actually um, build equity into their homes, et cetera. Um, so we just appreciate your time because I think it's been very helpful. And I know we're gonna have a lot more conversations about this. Um, so um, thank you. And um, I'm sure that staff can probably get us your presentation, um, which would be helpful. Um, I, I think folks would appreciate that. And we did record the meeting. So we are able to sort of share this with uh, some of our colleagues who might be interested in learning about this as well. Thank you, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate your time, I appreciate your patience. Um, I know this is a, a tricky subject, but I appreciate the uh, ability to share my research and thoughts with you. And and who do I send my big invoice to? I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> Thank you, thanks for going a little bit longer. We all appreciate it. Um, so with that, we are going to just um, finish up on a couple of things. Um, just a quick report out um, from me and then from James. And um, now I've got to find my notes here. So first of all, um, uh, Director Gialdo has her hand up. We still got her hand up. Jill, did you want to ask a question? You know, and not so much a question, but really just a, a thought or a comment. As I'm sitting, it's just been fascinating. It's it's so interesting, the presentation. But I can't help but stop and think of what's happening right now in our area with our school system. And we look and see, um, I know in my city, our schools are open. They're going five days a week, half days. And then I look and see in Sacramento County at some of the, this, and they are not going. And I think that ties so directly to this conversation. Um, I, I, so it's just one of those, it's just so timely right now, but you wanna look at a difference in how the students are being served. There's some pretty glaring differences when you cross a county line right now. And to his point about um, allowing our children have opportunity um, so that they can get a good education and opportunity to, to move up and into um, different opportunities. So yeah, and I think the Bee just did an article about people are bailing out of some of the school systems. Well, you, you can see why, and then you wonder those that are able to are, but what if they're not financially able to make that change? Very true, very true. All right, so um, thank you. A couple, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, we have implemented a buddy system for our new directors to uh, partner with uh, a director who's been around for a little while. So I hope that that is going well, or you've had an opportunity uh, to reach out to one another. Um, new directors, if you haven't heard yet from your buddy, let us know and we'll make sure you get connected. And then in the spirit of getting to know one another a little bit better, uh, a number of us were um, asked to uh, answer a couple of survey questions, uh, a little bit about how you got to school, why you ran for office, uh, what you've done in your downtime during COVID. Um, and it's really fun to read. So thank you for participating. It's, it's a really good way to get to know one another a little bit. 
uh, that maybe allow us to kick off for, uh, further conversations when we see one another in person. So um, thank you to the staff for putting that together. And thank you all for participating. Definitely take a few minutes um, to read that if you haven't yet had uh, the opportunity to do so. Finally, for me, um, a number of you might have received um, a scam email um, a couple of times from me or from other directors from SACOG. And so staff has taken down our email addresses off the website um, because that's happened a number of times. Um, so I wanted to alert you to that. And of course, people can get a hold of us different ways, um, but we've, we've taken our email addresses off of the SACOG website. So with that, James, I'm gonna turn it um, over to you. We do have board member reports. So does anybody have anything that's, um, that you want to share with the other directors before I move this on to James? Madam Chair? Yes, Director Solid. I just wanna mention uh, Monday, February 22nd is the 150th anniversary of Woodland's establishment as an incorporated city. It was formed by failed miners from the east who were good farmers. They came down the Feather and Yuba rivers to our county and they made fortunes here. 22 years later, they incorporated our city. So that's what we're celebrating. Thank you. Thank you, Director Stollard. Um, anyone else? All right, James, if you want to uh, share anything you need to share with the directors. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gore. Um, I thought that was an excellent workshop, by the way. You know, we haven't done one. We were we were thinking about you know the virtual environment, and obviously we'd still love to continue to get feedback from you all. Um, and I think for some of our newer board members too, as I was just trying to set that up in terms of our racial equity framework and uh, looking at the sort of the history of structural racism, how it persists today, and housing policy and zoning, and and really you know what you can all do about it. Uh, two, two things I just want to follow up on. One is you know, we have excellent resources uh, available on our website through staff. Our housing policy toolkit is really a menu that is tailor-made for all of our local jurisdictions in terms of um, as, you're, as you're updating your housing elements, as I mentioned, in the next, you know, four or six months and finishing those up. And, and we'll say more about this. And I think we're going to have a longer, um, deeper dive in the Lunar Committee in March. But this really is a huge year for housing. And uh, we are making ourselves available and, and we'll, we'll, we'll maybe make a more formal offer. But if you'd like our staff, and we have excellent staff on the housing topics, to come to your councils and boards of supervisors, uh, we, are, we are ready and willing to talk about housing big picture and what we have to do as a region um, to really tackle those things. And um, I just wanna put that, that, that emphasis, which I think our speaker, Stephen Endian said, um, Zoning reform is necessary, but not sufficient, right? And to rethink zoning is necessary, but not sufficient. And that is clearly gonna be in front of all of you coming soon. And if you also wanna dig into the topic of the history of housing and structural racism and segregation and how it persists, there's many, many resources. One I dug into, I really wanna highly recommend for all of you since you were so engaged in the Q&A is The Color of Law. The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, and we can do a follow-up as when Lynette sends the follow-up, we can, we can, I would really highly recommend that because it's very, very eye-opening, sometimes hard to read, but really important. Um, so again, thanks for the great conversation. Couple of other housekeeping items. Uh, again, if you remember pre-COVID, the veteran board members, we used to do lunches between the Transportation Committee and the Land Use Committees. Um, we, we did those a lot when we had new board members two years ago, we're gonna restart them in the virtual environment. So Thursday, March the 4th, and just check me on this, Lynette, I think I've got it right. We're doing our first virtual lunch, and this will be about transportation funding and specifically the funding round, um, you know, that's in, it will be in front of the board in the next couple of months in terms of the, the, the proposed grant awards, but also what is SACOG's role in transportation funding? I know that many of you talking to the newer board members, you know, that is a big reason you're here is to try to get more transportation investment for your, for your project. So uh, noon to one is typically how we do those. Thursday, March 4th, we'll send, a, and I'm just giving a preview, Lynette will send out the invite. And then the other thing, and Chair Gore, I know, um, again, uh, really appreciate your, your interest in making sure the board's really engaged this year with all the new board members and in a very tough, challenging virtual environment. 
but we are hoping that the conditions and COVID will allow us and hopefully easing and getting better in vaccinations and social distancing and hopefully our weather in September could allow us to actually do a board retreat. And uh, again, we'll send out a little bit more information on this, but I just wanna give a heads up because I know Chair Gore, you, um, you participated in the last couple. And I think they've been really helpful for board members to just kind of get out of the whatever environment <laughs> we happen to be in, get maybe get together uh, finally, but really dig into some really key topics that are in front of the board and in front of the region in the year ahead. So we're looking at two dates, Friday, September 17th or Friday, October 1st. Um, so again, we'll send out uh, uh, an invite for those. And that wraps it for me. And I am hoping to jump onto YouTube to watch with my family, the landing of the Perseverance on Mars. So my final, my final note, I think that is the coolest thing ever. So uh, uh, if you have a second, try to, try to watch. Great, well, thank you very much, James. Thank you all uh, for attending today. The remaining items are um, just received in files so you can review those, but thank you for um, the really good discussion. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next board meeting, which is Thursday, March 18th. And with that, we are adjourned for the day.